All right, we are back in Revelation chapter 7. We'll finish up chapter 7 today. Chapter 5, the worship of the Creator. Chapter 6, the introduction of the Lamb who is worthy to open the book. Chapter 7, we have the sealing of God's servants before um, certain judgments come upon the land. We had the saints last week, um, having seen the sealing of the servants of the Lord, sealed with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the providential protection of God, then they enjoy, and the angels all about them, worship the Lord and say salvation to our God. We come next to verses 13 to 17, in which after this uh, great event, John's watching this great event um, uh, unfold before him. And one of the elders in verse 13 says to John, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. And he said, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light upon them nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them under the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Father, we thank you for the new day that you have given to us, the new Lord's Day that you have given to us. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are glad and we rejoice in it. <clears throat> rejoice that we can gather together again in your house gather together again as your people uh, to fellowship with you, uh, to present ourselves before you. We come by the <clears throat> shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which alone we cleanse ourselves, by which alone we are made acceptable in the sight of God. And we are thankful, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who can Join us in the fellowship that we can have around your word. We pray for those who can't be with us, Brother Jim, uh, Brother Carl, Sister Lynn, uh, and any others, Lord, who are not well among us. We pray your blessings upon them regardless this day, where they are as they look upon thy word or they join us uh, on the air. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, send a blessing to each and every one by the power of thy spirit. We pray that you'd forgive our sins this morning, cleanse us from our unrighteousness and our righteous deeds or thoughts or words, and that you would purify our hearts so that we can hear from you this day. We desire to be a clean vessel and cleansed by thee and ask that you would teach us and direct us in all things. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7 and verse 13. So we have one of the elders that, are, that represent the church that are in this great picture, this great vision that John's having, asking John who these are that are arrayed in white robes. They're not the angels, and uh, they're not one of the other uh, creatures that are given to us in this vision. And John very wisely says to him, Sir, you know who they are. John is in the midst of this vision, uh, dumbstruck at all the glory that he has seen. And we don't have to have the answers to every question. Even the apostle John here doesn't know all things. He defers to the elder. Um, it's wisdom at times to defer to one we are sure of who knows the answer. And he's sure that this man knows the answer, who is here in glory itself. Sir, you know, and he said to me, these are they which came out of 
the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we'll back up one more time to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9 where he says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that they should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. We learn that there have all, there's always been martyrs in the church. Not everyone is a martyr. Not everyone is martyred for their faith. But there have always been martyrs and always will be until the return of Jesus Christ. We learn that regardless of the fact of whether a Christian is a martyr or not, we know from Scripture that the path of a Christian is not presented to us as something easy, as something that is a bed of roses, as the, as the hymn writer talks about. Um, so that idea is not a biblical idea. Um, there is an inward change made by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. There is great joy given in the soul for having heaven opened up, as it were, and understanding the world now and understanding salvation in Christ, yes. There is great inward joy with all of those things, but the path itself is not an easy path. It is a probation, as they would call it. Um, the old, old Puritans called it a probationary time before we get to the final destination where, where then things are made all right and we're loosed of our sinful corruptions in our body. We're loosed from the sinful influences around us of the world. We're loosed from the persecution of the world and the temptations of the devil. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.10, you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So he doesn't present it as, a, as an easy path for either the ministers or for the church itself. Acts 14, 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much, tribula through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So part of the discipleship of the apostles, part of their admonitions to the church in the first century was to persevere. You need to persevere because they knew that if these Christians were faithful Christians, that they would suffer in this world and there would be a temptation for them to leave the faith and to set the faith aside. So part of their admonitions, part of their discipleship was always to remain in the faith and that through much tribulation we have to enter into the kingdom of God, not to think that that's something unusual. In Matthew 16, when um, the Lord Jesus Christ, he says to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The cross being our identification with Jesus Christ. For whoever will save his life will lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake is going to find it. What is a man profited if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? What will he give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So the, the hope of an eternal reward is set out before us. Now, John is given in this final section in Revelation chapter 7. So we know from John that the path of the Christian is not an easy path. The martyrs have already been introduced to us. 
And, uh, and, and we know that there have been and shall be more martyrs. But John gives to these first century Christians and to us as well and to all Christians between, he has given a revelation of the comforts of heaven which await faithful saints who endure tribulation because he talks about them coming out of tribulation, the great tribulation. Some have only prescribed this to some certain small part and time of the world, but great tribulation has gone on throughout the world from the beginning of Christianity for the saints, and they have faced it and do presently. But there's six things I want us to look at that he gives to us in these verses, which I think are a great comfort uh, to, the, to this church and to any church and to any saint, the comforts of heaven which await faithful saints who persevere enduring tribulation. Number one, for saints struggling against sin, John sees these saints with white robes washed in Christ's blood. So the robes they have on, they have these long robes which are pictured to us consistently of heaven in the scriptures. And we think of, and, and trying to fix this in my own mind as far as the white robes, why does God picture it in this way? Our clothing, our, here are the robes, but our clothing often indicates our profession. Sometimes it indicates very much a earthly profession that you can tell the doctor when he comes in because he has a certain type of clothing on. You can tell this man, you can tell that lady, whoever. Um, so oftentimes that speaks of a profession. Now, for the saints, when we, when we get to Revelation chapter 19 and it talks again about the white robes, um, it is the righteousness of the saints. It speaks of the profession of Christianity itself. So we know that we have a calling. We have callings out in the world. Um, some do this work, some do that work. All of it's for the Lord. But there is the calling in Christ Jesus called to be saints, called to be Christians. And there is that profession as well, the profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so these have, he says in uh, verse 14, second half of it, they have washed their robes and made them white and made them white in the blood of the lamb. They washed their robes and they made them white. So I hope I'm not overthinking things. <laughs> with it, but there's a washing going on of these robes. He says they're washing their robes to make them white. And how that's done is in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. So we have a profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ now. We know that our profession of faith is stained from time to time with sin, that we have to go to the Lord, we have to ask forgiveness. Sometimes there can be terrible sins that a Christian may commit, as we've been as we've noted in the life of David and Saul and others, um, that there is, that, that we have the profession of Christianity, and yet part of our sorrows is, is that we stay in our own profession at times. We dishonor the Lord at times. It's a fact of the matter. We know it very closely within our own families. Our families know us the best. Um, you know, we can meet together in church and we can seem fine here and we can restrain ourselves and act decently toward each other <clears throat> most of the time. Um, even here, we may have problems with that as we spend more time together close to each other. We may have times in which we stain our profession by improper attitudes or words that are said. But... What I see here is an encouragement to all saints at all times because we have this profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our desire is not to stay in our profession. Our desire is to have that which shows forth the purity of our Lord Jesus Christ upon us. And 
these, it says, have taken their robes and they've washed them in the blood of Jesus Christ and they have these perfectly white robes because they're fixed in eternity with this glorification that no more sin and no more sorrow over sin, uh, no more staining our profession. They are fixed in a state of righteousness, fixed in a state of purity, fixed in a state of sinlessness in which they won't sin. They won't sin in word. They won't sin in deed. They won't sin in their thoughts, which is almost impossible for us to realize and think about because we're so used to the struggle that we have against sin. So Paul talks about the struggle in Romans chapter 7, numerous verses there in which he's talking about the great inward struggle that he has, and he finally finishes that chapter out by saying, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. It's Christ. It's the Lamb. It's being washed in the blood of the crucified Lamb. There is a, there is a sense, obviously, in which we are positionally perfect in Christ now, we're justified now. We don't become more justified. We are perfectly justified now in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we are set apart by God to be his. But we do see in ourselves a sanctification process which leads ultimately to that glorification instant, instantaneous, when you pass from this life and you go into the next life. If you are a Christian, then there is an instantaneous fixing in righteousness. So John gives this comfort. It's for saints, saints who have struggled against sin, and they've struggled against sin all of their lives. Uh, Psalm 51 is David's coming out of his great sin. And he talks about being washed, and he talks about being restored to God, and he talks about not losing that Holy Spirit unction and anointing for the kingship uh, out of what he has done. And he, he bemoans himself. John shows us that yes, there is a place in which all of that is finally fixed in a state of perfect righteousness. Galatians chapter six is the text. If somebody tries to tell me that, that that there is some state in which we finally, in, uh, while we're on the earth, before glorification, in which we can come to, in which we won't sin anymore. I go back to, to Revelation or Galatians 6. Galatians 6 and verse 7, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. So we have uh, within ourselves these, all of these commands in the Scriptures to sow and to sow the right things. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. If you make provision for the flesh, you're going to fall into sin. If you give in to temptation, you're going to fall and go into sin. And in chapter 5, in verse 16, says, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So if you're not walking in the Spirit, what are you going to do? You're going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to each other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So, the battle is on, and the battle is on for as long as you're alive on this earth. As long as you're breathing. So I've talked to old saints who, to the very end, speak of the struggle that they have had and continue to have. Even at the end, even after 50 years of being a Christian, studying, praying, being sanctified, still, they still talk about the struggle that they have. So that this is a great encouragement that John gives to the church because he shows them these people who are clothed now in white robes and they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb 
and they're fixed in a state of righteousness. For these saints who long for a greater reality of God, and that's what the saints long for. These are these that came out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So secondly, secondly, the comfort that, that John gives to them is that these saints who have desired uh, for the longest time to have the reality of God's presence in their life, this is what the saints desire. <clears throat> when we are in a right state, when we are not in a state of decline, we desire the presence of God in our life. We want to know more of the Lord, more of his presence. And uh, what John reveals to us here is in verse 15, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall tabernacle among them, dwell among them. He'll tabernacle with them. So these saints who have been all their life longing for a greater reality in the presence of God, John reveals that these are before the throne of God and he that sits before the throne of God is dwelling with them. He's tabernacling among them. You remember Moses? Moses came to the realization of who his people were. Carnally, he killed a man, thought that he would deliver the people that way. Run out of Egypt. God reveals himself to him in the burning bush. Tremendous revelation of God to his soul. Sends him back to Egypt. But that's, that wasn't enough for Moses. Moses still wanted more of the Lord. So that when we see him up on Sinai and we see him with the people in Deuteronomy, he's saying, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And I want, and if you don't go with me, if your presence doesn't go with me, I, we don't need to be going up. So we see this longing. David talks about it in the Psalms over and over again. Earnestly seeking the Lord, desiring to have more of the Lord. Uh, like a deer pants after the river's waters, I pant after you, O oh God. So these longings and these desires of these believers that they have had throughout their whole life is fulfilled in heaven because he speaks here of how that they are before the throne. They are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple and he that sits on the throne shall tabernacle among them, uh, dwell among them. And Ellicott talked about um, this tabernacling some uh, in his works on it. And I am... Uh, hunting it right now. I'll find it later. Um, but that's the second thing, the second thing. So he dwells with them, and this dwelling means there's a permanence there, and it means there's an intimacy, because the people we dwell with are the people that we're most intimate with. So those are the people we have our closest relationship with. It's the home. It's, it's where we are dwelling with them. And then secondly, to the church as well, there's a dwelling kind of dwelling here. And then the state is third with a citizenship. There's a dwelling also. But here the dwelling is with God. It's with the Lord. So it shows this permanence. It shows this intimacy that they have. So that heaven is not just an escape from tribulation because that's, he talked about that, and he talked about the, 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 the beauty of that, that we have escaped the tribulation, we've escaped the struggle of this earth. It's not just an escape from tribulation, but it's an abundant, as Peter talks about, an abundant entrance into the paradise of God, into God's garden of delights. So heaven was always pictured as a garden. And then in the east, they had their great garden. In Babylon, they had the great hanging gardens. And in England, they had their gardens as well, that, that were their gardens and their gardeners. I wouldn't mind having a garden as long as I could have a gardener to go with it. There's a lot of work in this world to have a garden. But the garden was pictured as a place where all of your senses are engaged. And so that's why heaven was pictured as that, you know, the sights. So in the garden, you have the sights, the beauty that you see of the flowers, the well-manicured lawns, the bushes, the trees, the fruitfulness. You have 
the sound of the birds in your garden that delights you. Um, if you're out in a place where you can hear the birds, not too close to the highway like some of us are, and the smell, the fragrance. So when the, when the different uh, plants come in and when the gardenias come in, you have those smells that come. And then you have the touch as well, the touch of the velvety mullein or the silky plants or various things, all the different textures that there are there in the garden and the taste of uh, all kinds of fruits and foods and things. But it's all of the senses being engaged in the garden and that's what heaven is described as and that we are there with God in this wonderful place. So this is the picture that John gives to the first century church. It's a, it's a very comforting picture. Thirdly, for those dear saints who their whole life what they desired, this one thing, can I just be useful in the kingdom of heaven? Just make me useful in your kingdom, Lord. After God has saved us and delighted us with his own presence and his salvation, it becomes the desire of our heart to be useful, to be useful. And John describes them, not only are they before the throne of God, dwelling with God in this intimacy with all these delights, but it says, and they serve him day and night. You see, because service is not a dirty word for a Christian. <laughs> to serve is what we were made for. We were made to work. We were made to labor. We were made to serve, actually, God as the first and best of beings. He created us to serve him. No matter what your calling is, it doesn't matter what your calling is. If it's a lawful calling, it is to serve the Lord in that calling. So the saints who have desired all their life just to be useful and to serve the Lord find that they can do this in heaven. In heaven, they serve him day and night. The scripture describes it as. So... Heaven is a rest, there's no doubt about that, rest from our trials and troubles and temptations and, uh, and other things as we're about to see, but it is also a place of service to God, service to God. Fourthly, for those saints who have suffered the deprivations, certain deprivations for the sake of God's kingdom, John sees also this kingdom of comforts. So he says in verse 16, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light upon them, nor any heat, nor any heat. No more hunger, no more thirst. The world in general presently is a place of desires, desires that have to be satisfied and have to be satisfied again and again and again and again. So... You have your meal, as all the ladies can attest to. <laughs> that continual work of making a meal, spending all that time, eating it in much less time generally, in the West at least. Maybe that's why in the East they spend a long time eating because they give their ladies more satisfaction. But we finish our meal and then we do our dishes and then in a few more hours we're doing the whole thing again again because there is this hunger and this, there's this desire and, uh, and this pain if it doesn't come quickly enough so that we have to continually fulfill these things in this world. We're continually getting hungry. We're continually getting thirsty. In heaven, we are not driven by needs. All needs are met and they are met eternally. We know our Lord Jesus Christ ate after his resurrection and he didn't do it because his body needed it. And he didn't do it because he was having hunger pains. He did it just to have fellowship with his disciples. And so there seems to be eating and drinking and feasting in heaven too. But it's not driven by the fact that, oh, I've got to do this or I'm going to get weak. I'm going to get tired. I won't be able to do my work. All the things that are associated with eating and drinking today. So he says in heaven, he says, no more hunger and no more thirst. Now, are there those that also apply this spiritually or metaphorically? 
the Christian hungers and thirsts after righteousness, that there will be no more hungry and thirsting in the sense that there will be sight and that, that God will be there. So frugality is often necessary here upon the earth. In communism, it's a principle of communism, frugality, because you're not going to have much. You're just going to have to live with less, as that's how they live. It's a way of life. And the people of God fast and pray. And some of the people of God have very little means, and they live with deprivation. Some of them live with a stomach that's hungry most of the time in this world. So Christ tells us that in this revelation that in heaven none of that will be taking place. They will neither hunger no more, neither will they thirst anymore. Any anxiety here upon the earth, Christ has to warn us against anxiety. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall put on. Your Father knows you need these things. And so we are taught to trust the Lord for these basic needs. In heaven, these needs are fully and completely met with no sense of need with them. And he goes on to say that the sun will not light upon them nor any heat, nor any heat. Part of the curse is that we live by the sweat of our brow. That was, that was what was initially told to us. You are, gonna, you are going to spend your time sweating to just live, to just live, to just function in this world. You're going to have to work and you're going to have to work hard in order to function and live. But in heaven, we will feel no withering heat, because the lamb is the light of that place. Here we feel the heat, especially of the Alabama sun. It wears us out. It tires us out. We feel our aging process at times. We feel the sinking of our vital energies. That's how we feel. And so we say, okay, I need this. I need to get some water. I need to get some food or I need to get some herbs or whatever it is that we think we need in order to quit the withering feeling that we feel. In heaven, there's no withering feeling. So that is a great comfort that is, is given to the saints as well. And there are saints who have purposefully deprived themselves at times of things in order to bring the gospel to various parts of the world. All of that is involved. And then also, fifthly, for saints who have fallen in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, John sees an eternal fountain of blessing in, in this relationship with Christ in heaven. He says in verse 17, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, shall feed them and lead them to living fountains of waters. The idea of feeding them is a shepherd. That's the shepherd and that's consistent throughout the scriptures. Jacob at the end of his day said, the Lord who fed me all the days of my life is the old King James and the Hebrew can be shepherded me. He shepherded me all the days of my life because shepherding is primarily getting the feed, getting the sheep to food and to drink. So here we have the lamb, we have the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the good shepherd and the good shepherd who gave his life for us is now sustaining our life for an eternity as well. He not only gives us our life, but he sustains our life. And we have this love relationship and this relationship with an eternal glory. He shall feed them and he shall lead them. Elsewhere in the book of Revelation, it talks about a marriage feast. Elsewhere in the Gospels, it talks about Christ coming and serving his disciples in eternal glory. The idea of banqueting and feeding them and, and rejoicing with them. So the saints see this eternal fountain of blessing, this eternal fountain of blessing. Adam Clark, I really appreciated his, his notes on this in talking about the living fountains of water that Christ is leading us to. 
A spring in the Hebrew phraseology is termed living water because it's constantly boiling up and running on. By these perpetual fountains, we are to understand the endless sources of comfort and happiness which Jesus Christ will open out of his own infinite plentitude to all glorified souls. These eternal living fountains will make an infinite variety, and I appreciate that phrase, an infinite variety in the enjoyments of the blessed. There will be no sameness and consequently no enjoying with the perpetual enjoyment of the same things, no cloying, it was the term that he used, the old word cloying meaning this sickening sweetness when there's too much sweetness. So he says, heaven will not be like that. No, it will be sweet and it will be enjoyment, but it will not be just the same old thing so that we just get used to it because it flows out of the infinite plentitude of Christ. He says, as God is infinite, so his attributes are infinite. And throughout and throughout infinity, more and more of these attributes will be discovered, and the discovery of each will be a new fountain or source of pleasure and enjoyment. These sources must be opening through all of eternity, and yet through all of eternity there will still remain in the absolute perfections of the Godhead an infinity of them to be opened. This is one of the finest images in the Bible. And, and perhaps I would add to that, In heaven, we will not have the same propensity to forget God's goodness and things that we have learned, nor do I think we will have the same propensity to sameness, to viewing sameness as something, oh, that's passe, or I already knew that. But the excitement and the glory of what we learn will, I think, remain with us at all times, so that it doesn't just become, oh, well, I already knew that. And then finally, the final comfort that he gives to us, the saints who have wept much while they're here upon the earth. John sees the father's affectionate hand wiping away his child's tears, a picture given to us later on in Revelation as well, in Revelation 22, 21 and 22, when it's unveiled there. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So he speaks to the saints. He speaks to the saints, those who have been martyred, um, the tears there, those who have watched their friends be martyred or their family be martyred. Perhaps perhaps they themselves were not martyred, but their family was or a friend was or somebody that they knew or heard about or that we hear about across the world somewhere. He says he removes the tears, the tears that have been felt, sorrow for sin, the tears that have been felt for the persecutions of this world, the tears uh, that have been felt in prayer, lifting up individuals in prayer, watching our loved ones die, uh, watching little children die, a very hard thing in this world to see sin, uh, sin as far as its curse upon the world, ravage even a child, childhood diseases. Very, very difficult to watch that. How many tears have been shed over such things? And uh, he says that the father will wipe away the tears of his uh, child, of his child, of these weary ones, of these weary ones. So that Clark writes, the tears from their eyes, all causes of distress and grief, they shall have pure, unmixed happiness. Reader, This is the happiness of those who are washed from their sins. Are you washed? Do not rest until you're prepared to appear before God and the Lamb in this way. If these saints had not met with troubles and distresses, in all likelihood they had not excelled so much in righteousness and true holiness. When all the avenues of worldly comfort are shut up, We are obliged to seek everything in God, and there is nothing sought from God that's not found in Christ. And so we go to Christ, we go to Christ. But these are the comforts, these are the comforts.
For saints struggling with sin, there's saints there washed in the blood, white robes, purity fixed in righteousness. God is dwelling with them. Uh, they, they always wanted his presence and now his presence is there with them. They always wanted to be useful. They are there serving day and night. Uh, they have felt the deprivations of this world and now there's no more hunger, no more thirst. They have fallen in love with Christ. He sees this eternal fountain of blessing that Christ is taking them to and all the enjoyments that could possibly be known and not many can be known by our poor minds and hearts. And the saints who have wept much, they will weep no more. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the comforts of eternal glory of heaven that you set before us for your children who love the Lord Jesus Christ, who have been washed in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who do not seek a righteousness of their own, but rest in the righteousness of Christ alone. We ask, O oh God, that you would indeed remind us of these eternal glories as we traverse this world and as we go about our business trying to serve thee acceptably with a pure heart and uh, in the midst of the troubles, difficulties, pains that we feel in this world. May these uh, great comforts that you reveal to us be set before our eyes and uh, encourage our hearts to continue on. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.